Hi. In this video, I'm going to be showing you five different ways of getting data from and onto your retro PC. I'm going to be looking at the kind of components that you need, both on a hardware and a software level. Look at the complexity of each solution and do some benchmarking to see which way is the fastest. And no, I'm not going to be using floppies in this video. The idea for making this video came from this machine, the knocking Commodore PC-20. Lots of people suggested that I should just low-level format the hard drive. But before I do that, I wanted to make a backup of everything that was on it. But looking at the system, it has very little connectivity. It has two ports, a serial and a parallel port. Ports that are also still found on more modern PCs, like my AMD Athlon from 2006. So let's kick things off with this serial null modem cable. A very simple cable using a 9-pin D subconnector that can be used to hook up two computers. Now what's special about a null modem cable is that the RX and the TX, or the receive and the transmit lines, are cross-linked. And that allows it to communicate using two computers. So just to verify that we are in fact dealing with a null modem cable, I'm using these jumper wires and hooking them up to my multimeter just to make sure that the RX and the TX pin correspond. If this was a normal serial cable, you wouldn't be able to make these type of connections. Now, null modem cables typically come in this 9-pin D sub form factor. It's the same port as a mouse and it was very popular in the 90s. But this machine is from the 80s and it doesn't have a 9-pin D sub connector. It uses a 25-pin serial pinout. So for that we're going to be using this adapter that plugs into the 25-pin port of the PC and then we can just hook up our null modem cable like this. Switching over to our modern PC, which does have the 9-pin D sub-connector for the serial port, all we need to do here is just plug in the other end of the null modem cable and we should be good to go. So, first thing we need to do is we need to start our old computer using an MS-DOS application called InterServe. So InterServe is an executable which came with MS-DOS and it will basically turn your old computer into a server, allowing it to share whatever drives this computer has. Now on the modern PC, we can run the client version of InterServe, which is called Interlink. Now this is also an executable that needs to be put in your config.sys, and when the computer starts, it will automatically scan the serial and parallel ports to see if something is connected. It will actually make the connection and map the drives on the other system. So here I can access my old XT machine from my modern computer. And on the InterServe application, you can see that the drive is being accessed by the other computer. You can even launch applications on the old computer from the other computer. So as a benchmark, I wanted to copy my entire hard drive over the serial null modem cable onto the other computer. So I'm using Norton Commander here to copy the entire content. I found out that it took about 35 minutes to copy everything from this 21 megabyte hard drive onto the other computer. 17 megabytes of data spread across 350 files. So this is obviously not going to break any speed records, so it will be interesting to see how the next method will perform. And that brings us to the parallel cable. Now, obviously, parallel, as the name states, should be very much faster than serial, but this is not your ordinary parallel cable that you would use in, like, a printer or something. Much like the null modem cable, there is also something like a cross-link parallel cable. I actually purchased this one as a laplink cable, laplink being the software that is capable of transferring files from one computer to another using a parallel cable, but this is very much a direct parallel cable. So I needed to uh, cut it in half, find out which wires I needed to connect, strip them, and write everything down, tin the cables so that I can hook them together. 
so that we can finally use our newly created cable to do some data transfers. Now, parallel ports have been around since the very first PC, so this Commodore PC is no exception. It will happily accept this 25-pin parallel cable. So we'll hook it up on the Commodore PC. And we'll do the same thing on the modern PC, which still also has a parallel port. Now, obviously, new PCs don't have parallel ports anymore, but up until about, I think, 2010 or even later, lots of PCs still came with these parallel ports. So when we do the same thing, we start InterServe on the old computer and we start our new computer. The Interlink software on the new computer will find the old one over the LPT parallel port and we can do the exact same test. And what we noticed was that it was indeed a bit faster than the serial modem cable, bringing down the overall time to 25 minutes. Again, still not a record breaking speed. Now, there are a couple of things that you can tweak on the computer's parallel port, but as the old computer doesn't support any kind of bi-directional communication on the parallel port, these changes aren't really going to make that much of a difference. Now, you don't have to use a second computer to copy your data to, but you could use an external device like this external parallel port zip drive, a device which was very popular in the 90s to add some external storage to your computer. It features 100 megabyte zip disks. And it's the equivalent of an external hard drive as we know it today. So this was the iOmega zip drive device itself. It could be placed horizontally or vertically. It was a nice looking uh, device and it featured a parallel port so that it would be hooked up to the parallel port of your PC. And via a daisy chaining mechanism, you could attach your printer to the zip drive so you wouldn't have to sacrifice your parallel port. So it came with this standard parallel cable that you would hook up to the parallel port of your PC and hook it up to the zip drive. The disks that were used on these zip drives looked like this and they could carry 100 megabytes. And at the time, this was a big plus because you only had 1.44 megabyte disk drives at the time. Now, standard iOmega drivers won't work on these old 8088 machines. PalmZip is a device driver that allows you to use your iOmega zip drive on these old computers. There is a demo version that you can try out, but I highly recommend going for the registered version and shelling out 8 euros for it. It's a really nice way to hook up this zip drive to these old computers and have some external storage. It will assign a drive letter into your MS-DOS environment, allowing you to access whatever zip disk you put in the zip drive. It also comes with some tools to format your zip disks. Because older versions of MS-DOS don't support partitions that are bigger than 30 megabytes. And as the zip disk has a capacity of 100 megabytes, this can sometimes lead to problems. So as the zip drive is being accessed through the parallel port, and the zip drive media isn't the fastest one either, it's only natural to see that this way of copying is even slower than the parallel cable that we tried earlier. But still the zip drive remains a really great addition to your retro arsenal. Up until now we didn't have the need to open the PC case as both the zip drive, the serial cable and the parallel cable can be hooked up externally very easily. The next method that we'll try out will force us to open up the PC case as we are going to be adding some storage internally into the PC. Now, the PC has an MFM hard drive, obviously, and it has an MFM controller. Now, this is the card, the MFM controller that hooks up your hard drive and allows you to access it. But now we're going to be adding a new controller that allows us to add a compact flash card and use that as internal storage. It's based on the XT IDE Universal BIOS, which is flashed onto this chip right here. So think of it as a second hard drive that we'll be adding to our system. So the XT IDE Universal BIOS and the card goes into this ISA slot here. We're going to be attaching our compact flash as storage. And we're going to be hooking it up alongside our MFM controller, 
giving us in effect a second hard drive to work with. So when we boot a PC with this card in place, we see the XT IDE Universal BIOS popping up. Here you can see we both have a C and a D drive letter, meaning that we can access both the MFM hard drive as well as the compact flash. So here we see the 20 megabytes of MFM and the two gigabytes of compact flash. So as we can access both storage units within the PC, I'm going to be copying the content from the MFM hard drive onto the compact flash card via the XT IDE card. And as you can see, it's a lot faster than the previous methods that we looked at, clocking in at about 13 minutes to copy the entire content of the hard drive over to the compact flash card. Now the final method that we'll be looking at into this video is Ethernet, adding a network interface card to the old XT computer, making it work, hooking it up to your home network and using the home network to copy files to another PC. Now here we have a 3COM 3C507 networking card. Early 90s, I guess, a little bit too new for our old Commodore PC. If you want to go for really period correct networking cards, you'll end up with cards like this. 8-bit networking cards with uh, BNC connectors, so no RJ45 cables. Very difficult to set up, very difficult to find drivers. So I've opted to not go for the period correct method, but instead opt for a more readily available 16-bit network interface card that should work in an 8-bit ISO slot on an XT machine. The fact that it has an RJ45 connector is making it a lot easier to hook it up to my home network. So I just plug it into the 8-bit uh, ISO slot so you have part of the ISA uh, connector sticking out, but that's just fine. We'll hook up our RJ45 networking card. The LED lights up on the network interface card and we can go ahead and configure it. Now, most of these old cards come with a DOS-based setup program, allowing you to set up things like IO addresses, IRQs. So it's all about finding a configuration that works for you on your particular PC. There are definitely a lot of downsides in trying to make this work on an old XT machine. XT machines are very slow. The fact that this is a 16-bit network interface card that you're trying to use in an 8-bit ISA slot isn't ideal. For example, I wasn't able to save any values to the networking card. I could only read the configuration. So I needed to use another PC to set the values until I came up with something that actually worked on this old XT machine. Luckily, the software had an internal test program allowing me to test not only the uh, internal uh, network interface card things, but also the external connection. So everything seemed to work fine, but then you still need to install some MS-DOS specific software in order to get like a TCP IP stack or something running. It's very cumbersome. It's very slow. It's not standard, but in the end, I finally managed to get it done. So I was able to boot the PC. The PC was able to uh, connect to my uh, network, get an IP address, and I could hook it up to a Windows 98 machine that I had uh, lying around. So here you can see it connecting to the Windows 98 machine to a test share folder that it maps to the F drive in your MS-DOS environment. And using the netview command, it is able to detect other devices on this network as well. But on to the actual test. As we are able to map a networking share to an MS-DOS drive letter, it's very easy to copy files around. It's faster than the serial and parallel port cable, but it's not as fast as the XT IDE internal copy. So this one clocked in at around 18 minutes. So let's end the video with a little overview of the various methods that we have outlined here, starting with the null modem serial cable. Very easy to set up. So we just need to hook up the serial cable to the corresponding port of the machines. We do need two machines, but in order to transfer files, all we need is interserve and interlink from MS-DOS.
It is the slowest method of the five that we have seen here, so for large data sets I would not opt for this. Moving on to our lap link cable or parallel crosslink cable. Uh, same story as with the null modem serial cable, very easy to set up. All we need is interserve and interlink, works with uh, virtually any PC. But it is, although faster than the serial cable, it is still pretty slow, clocking in at 25 minutes here. Now the zip drive is also a nice way of transferring data, especially the fact that you have uh, removable storage with these zip disks. You can use the zip disks in other PCs that have, for example, an internal zip drive. So that makes it very easy. There is good support across the board, ranging from XT to higher end machines. It is a bit slow clocking in at 30 minutes but the zip drive in itself is very versatile and i really like the look and feel of the zip drive and the zip disks now the xt ide cards are really really nice they make for very fast transfer rates because everything is internal it's uh, just copying from your mfm drive onto the compact flash there is no external connections to be made. Uh, it's very convenient because you can use the compact flash in modern PC. So you're able to put da data onto your retro PC very easily. It's a very versatile solution. You do need to open up the computer, insert the card. Uh, if the card hasn't been flashed before, you will need to flash it. Potentially, you'll also need to configure it so that it doesn't clash with your MFM controller or other hardware. But it's again a really nice uh, versatile solution. And finally moving to the Ethernet or networking card. Uh, I do like this solution, the fact that you are able to hook up an old PC onto an existing uh, network. Uh, makes it very easy to copy files. It's not as fast as the XT IDE approach, but it's a lot more flexible because you can put a lot more onto the network. It does require a lot of configuration and a lot of patience, especially on XT machines to set up everything correctly. There's not only the hardware aspect of the network interface card, but also the various software bits that you need to get right. A lot of this software takes some tweaking in order to run on an, on an XT machine. But in the end, if you do manage to set it up, it is a pretty nice way to get your computer onto the network. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video and if you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribe if you want to see more of this type of content. I will be doing a more in-depth video on MS-DOS networking and perhaps also the iOmega zip drive. Or if you have any other suggestions, please give a comment below. Uh, please give me your feedback and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.